European social theory, whatever its other differences of approach, has a shared view on the emergence of modernity and the rise of the West. It has also operated with a particular understanding of Europe's world historical contribution associated with a stadial idea of the progressive development of societies. In this module, we've taken issue with such understandings, arguing both that modernity had broader conditions of emergence and development, and that there is a need to acknowledge global processes, such as colonialism and the European trade in human beings, that have not often been discussed within sociology and other social sciences. European colonialism was a context within which modernity developed and within which the social theory identified as the modern canon was formulated. Yet colonialism received little explicit attention as central to modernity. At best, colonialism is understood as part of the transition from feudalism to capitalist modernity. It is around this transition that sociology organised its key concepts and analytical categories. The issue now is not simply to add colonialism to sociology's repertoire of topics, but to propose something more fundamental. The argument made here is for a renewal of social theory and sociology, not an addition to its topics or its rejection. Central to this renewal is to recognise and address five fictions that currently organise conceptual frameworks in sociology. These are the fiction of stages of social development, the fiction of modern subjectivity, the fiction of the nation state, the fiction of class and formerly free labour, and finally the fiction of sociological reason itself. <clears throat> These fictions are presented as a distillation of the lessons to be learnt from an examination of the classical tradition. We do not take issue with the centrality of the selected authors to contemporary sociology, but we do take issue with what contemporary sociology takes to be central in their work. The first of the fictions is associated with the idea of a state of nature. This was initially developed in Hobbes and Locke as part of their discussions of the possession and use of resources available to humanity in common. It appears to establish a common humanity, but it does so in order to justify inequality and differential treatment. It's a construction which depends upon a distinction between the state of nature and the state of society where the latter is the colonising society of Europe. Out of this initial construction there arises a concern to delineate the characteristics of modern society against which other societies can be described and classified. Once the different stages of society are delineated, it became possible to arrange them hierarchically in terms of ideas of development and progress and to associate different kinds of social relationship with each type of society. It's evident that colonialism is directly connected to the emergence of modern society, but it comes to be attributed to a late stage of feudal society involving encounters with people at earlier stages of development. The taking of other people into possession is then understood not simply as beneficial for those who derived profit from it, but also as a civilising process for those who are subject to it. We need to move away from the idea of types of society which can be understood separately from the relationships among them and instead understand how it is those very connections that structure ideas of difference and domination. The idea of progress and the normative weight attached to it is connected to the second fiction, that of the special nature of modern subjectivity. Modern society is understood to inaugurate a distinctive kind of subjectivity associated with the modern individual and his or her self-determining capacity to act on the basis of reason and self-interest. This is the individual capable of property contrasted to those who are either incapable of 
or indifferent to private property. Yet these latter states are the product of European colonialism and not simply the condition it confronted. In the tradition of modern social theory, modern reason is about the development of autonomy and freedom and subjecting institutions, including those of religion, to criticism on the basis of reason. This construction is powerful because it also inaugurates the possibility of self-criticism as outlined, for example, in the approach of Frankfurt School critical theory. The very idea of an unfinished project of modernity, such as is proposed by Frankfurt School theorists, involves the idea of modernity itself as a project of civilization where all pre-modern societies are understood as beset by traditional authority and inadequate selves and not as the basis of knowledge and experiences from which we can also learn. The third fiction is the idea of the nation-state. In the development of the idea of the modern individual, two forms of sovereignty are outlined. One is the individual as sovereign, and the other is that of the political authority that guarantees the liberty of sovereign individuals. In early modern thought, that political authority is associated with a commonwealth, with no necessary territorial limits, and indeed in justification of the extension of colonial territory. However, the exercise of political authority comes to be associated with nation states and European nation states in particular. Weber's formulation has become the exemplary expression of the position within sociology. The nation state is understood to have a legitimate claim to the monopoly of violence within a given territory with legitimacy associated with the state's responsibility for and to its citizens within that territory. Yet not all members of the population are regarded as citizens or members of what Tocqueville called the Society of Equals. Further, all European nation states, including their settler offshoots, were either empires or participated in the construction of empires through the movement of their populations. The latter movement both consolidated empires and contributed to their societies being in fact societies of unequals. Subjects of empire are de denied inclusion in the community to whom the patrimony of empire is distributed and after decolonization came to be denied citizenship within former colonising societies. This is the context in which those who share a common political heritage of European empire are now represented as immigrants within its metropoles and as such seen as threats to the solidarity of the nation and its social contract which excludes them. The fourth fiction is that of class and formerly free labour. Marx recognised that modern society was developing internally as a society of unequals, that is, as a class-divided society. This class division he associated with the system of private property. On the basis of the development of the class relation, proletarian agency would develop to transform private property and create a new society based on the satisfaction of needs rather than the pursuit of profit. The class division that Marx described depends upon the centrality of formerly free labour and the commodification of labour power within capitalist modernity. However, this is called into question once we understand the colonial and imperial nature of modernity. Commodified labour power does not develop as the central form of capitalism and moreover capitalist nation states are able to divide their populations between national citizens and colonial subjects. As Du Bois noted, this provides possibilities of the decommodification of labour power within the metropole 
utilising colonial patrimonies in the provision of welfare and other collective goods nationally that are denied to those in the wider empire. At the same time, colonial subjects are denied the status of free labour and are subordinated within various forms of indenture. In this context, enslavement represents the commodification of the labourer, while the abolition of slavery does not give rise to free labour, but to new forms of indenture. Both are enduring features of modernity. For example, indenture returns within the contemporary metropole in the form of the treatment of migrant labour as not deserving the rights and rewards associated with the citizenship status afforded to nationals. This is something we see in the seasonal visa arrangements for migrant workers in post-Brexit Britain. And it's something which is not a contingency of Brexit, but deeply embedded in the social and political structures of modernity. Karen E. Fields, a recent translator of Durkheim, states that, quote, unreasonable divisions of humankind seem to be born from reason itself, not from its opposite. This leads to our final fiction of sociological reason. The dominant forms of sociological method all present sociological reason as ahistorical and as the necessary presupposition for objective inquiry. In this way, sociological reason is made part of the general claim of the Enlightenment and sociology's difference is simply the extent to which it aligns itself with a critical project that continues it. However, this project is not the self-critical project it claims to be. In arguing this, we're not proposing a form of relativism or multiple per perspectives, but for a transformation of our own perspective as a consequence of learning from the experiences of others. The first step in any process of learning is the recognition of a limitation in one's own understanding. We've shown that colonialism structures European modernity as well as European thought, and in consequence, recognising its significance is an opportunity as well as a necessity to practice, sociologically diff practice sociology differently. Our purpose has been forward-looking in terms of how we can reconstruct the concepts and categories of modern social theory to be able to intervene more effectively in the address of contemporary social problems. Modern social theory and sociology are part of the problem and its renewal is necessary to any solutions.